Gateway. Cinema is valuable not for its ability to make visible the hidden outlines of our reality, but for its ability to reveal what reality itself veils, the dimension of fantasy. This is why, to a person, the first great theorists of film decry the introduction of sound and other technical innovations, such as color, that pushed film in the direction of realism. Since cinema was an entirely phantasmatic art, these innovations were completely unnecessary, and what's worse, they could do nothing but turn filmmakers and audiences away from the phantasmatic dimension of cinema. Potentially transforming film into a mere delivery device for representations of reality, as long as the irrealism of the silent black and white film predominated, one could not take filmic fantasies for representations of reality. But sound and color threatened to create just such an illusion, thereby destroying the very essence of film art. As Rudolf Arnheim puts it, the creative power of the artist. Can only come into play where reality and the medium of representation do not coincide. Exercise one: We take it for granted that our children will grow up and grow away, that our grandchildren will live in different cities from ourselves, and that we will change jobs at least a few or perhaps many times in our lives. We also take it for granted that with such job changes. We will usually also change the place we live and the friends we have. With all this mobility, we lose our extended families, and then we lose those friends we had found to replace the families left behind. Yet humans are affiliative animals, biologically not meant to spend their lives too far from the pack. We long for affiliation. We seek it. In fantasy, in art, and in all the devices we have invented to overcome the social isolation that our mobile lifestyle generates, so now, fueled by internet, telephone, and email communications, we have adapted to that lifestyle and have begun to take for granted commuting spouses and LDRs, long-distance romances. Exercise two: The root cause of anxiety differs from person to person. In truth, no one knows precisely what causes anxiety. However, several different factors are involved that ultimately lead to a state of anxiety. One of these includes past experiences or experiences from a young age, painful experiences as a child, such as abuse, neglect, the loss of a parent. Or bullying can lead to anxiety in later life. Your current life situation can also cause anxiety. If you are out of work, have money issues, or have lost someone close to you, your anxiety levels may rise. Physical or mental health problems can also lead to anxiety. For example, when you're living with a serious illness or tackling a psychological issue such as depression. Exercise three: The nature of life, the property of being living, has always been a puzzle for philosophers. Descartes tried to solve it by simply ignoring it. An organism is really nothing but a machine, he said. And other philosophers, particularly those with a background in mathematics, logic, physics, and chemistry, tended to follow him and operated as if there was no difference between living and inanimate matter. But this did not satisfy most naturalists. They were convinced that in a living organism, certain forces are active that do not exist in inanimate nature. They concluded that just as the motion of planets and stars is controlled by an occult. Invisible force called gravitation by Newton. The movements and other manifestations of life in organisms are controlled by an invisible force, vis vitalis. Those who believed in such a force were called vitalists. Exercise four. We all believe that we have knowledge of facts extending far beyond those we directly perceive. The scope of our senses is severely limited in space and time. Our immediate perceptual knowledge does not reach to events that happened before we were born, to events that are happening now in certain other places, or to any future events. 
We believe, nevertheless, that we have some kind of indirect knowledge of such facts. We know that a glacier once covered a large part of North America, that the sun continues to exist at night, and that the tides will rise and fall tomorrow. Science and common sense have at least this one thing in common: each includes knowledge of matters of fact that are not open to our direct inspection. Indeed, science purports to establish general laws or theories that apply to all parts of space and time without restriction. A science that consisted of no more than a mere summary of the results of direct observation would not deserve the name. Exercise five: The health and well-being of people, communities, and the biosphere are interlinked. Our bodies exemplify the patterns of healthy living systems. For example, our cells self-organize in many networks to keep us alive and thriving. Nested in an interconnected and interdependent web of life, humans are similarly cells in the body of a living Earth, and thus need to be in service to life. Instead, our species has organized and patterned itself in human communities that are at war with the web of life. If this condition existed in our own bodies, it would be akin to an autoimmune disorder, cells at war with the host organism. Infinite economic growth on a finite living planet is akin to the logic of cancer in a body, cells growing out of control until they kill the host. From the cells in our bodies to the biosphere, aligning with a living Earth worldview is fundamental to our long-term survival as a species. Exercise six. Modern secular persons sometimes smile cynically at any mention of truthfulness because modern society makes truth and truthfulness difficult accomplishments. But still, the term truth has meaning, and truthfulness means the habit of speaking what one understands to be true. Sometimes, to know what is true is difficult, and sometimes it is difficult even to speak what one knows to be true. But this is not the same as to deny the existence of truth or truthfulness. Even the cynic knows when he is not being truthful, when he is deliberately deceiving someone, or hiding the truth, or twisting it for convenience. The virtue of truthfulness is a habit of telling the truth, even when it is not convenient or does not serve a personal convenience. This virtue rests upon and develops into a person's self the instinctive sense that it is right to be truthful, and that truthfulness has to do with the kind of person we come to be. Exercise seven. To some degree, bilingual children might be able to transfer knowledge across their languages to overcome the reduced input in each language. For example, one study found that bilingual children who knew more words in one of their languages also knew more words in their other language. On the other hand, children might also experience language interference. For example, in a recent study investigating whether a bilingual sixteen-month-old could learn rhyming words, children learning dissimilar languages performed worse than children learning more similar languages. However, children's real-world vocabulary sizes did not differ depending on how similar their languages were, suggesting that language similarity might not affect the overall rate of language acquisition. Indeed, other research suggests that the development of bilingual children's two languages proceeds relatively independently. For example, in a study of Spanish-English learning toddlers. Vocabulary size in one language predicted grammatical development in the same language, but not in the other language. Exercise eight: The production and efficient use of nutrients by coral reef communities result in high primary productivity. This is reflected in the richness of the community. Scientists aren't sure, however, just how much primary production there is on coral reefs, or which particular organisms are the most important producers. There is no doubt that zooxanthellae are very important, 
but because they live inside corals, it is hard to measure exactly how much organic matter they produce. For a time, it was thought that very few animals eat coral, since there is so little live tissue on a coral colony. It was therefore believed that even though zooxanthellae produce a lot of organic matter, most of it is consumed by the coral, and not much is passed on to the rest of the community. As biologists looked closer, however, they found more and more animals that eat corals or their products. Primary production by coral zooxanthellae, therefore, it can be important not only to corals but also to the community at large.